Well, howdy everybody. Hope you're ready for another lab from the barn. Uh, today what we're going to look at is Hess's Law and the methods for measuring the heats of reactions called calorimetry. We spare no expense for our students. We bought the finest Dixie Cup calorimeters that money can buy. But before we actually dive into the experiment itself, we need to do a little bit of background on how we measure the heats of reactions. So, here you go. Okay, today's experiment that's going to illustrate Hess's Law for us requires that we measure the heats of a couple reactions, meaning how much heat does the reaction give off to its surroundings. And we're going to run a couple of them in, and again, we spare no expense for our students, so we've gotten you the, the finest styrofoam cup calorimeters in order to run these reactions and measure the change in temperature and the exchange of heat with the surroundings. But we've got two reactions for you to run. One is familiar, it's, we used it in the ideal gas constant lab. We're going to react magnesium and hydrochloric acid to make magnesium chloride and hydrogen gas. This time we're going to let the hydrogen gas go. But it is a nice exothermic reaction and so we can get a nice measurement of the heat of the reaction. And then we're going to react some magnesium oxide, which is just kind of a white powder. It's actually the ash that we created when we burned the magnesium that day in lab. We're going to react the ash with hydrochloric acid. It turns out to react exothermically to make magnesium chloride and water. And again, it gives a significant change in temperature, so it's an easy enough reaction for us to measure its heat. Well, in order to understand how we're going to actually measure the heats of the reactions, we need a little bit more background on thermochemistry. So here you go. Okay, in our discussions of thermochemistry, they always start off by talking about what's called the system, which is pretty much everything inside the beaker, and the surroundings, which is everything that's not inside the beaker. We have a certain sign convention that we adhere to about when heat is either given off by the system to the surroundings, which by the way, if heat is evolved, they refer to that as being exothermic. However, if heat is absorbed by the system, and these would get cold to the touch, that's always a little confusing for everybody. You'd think if the system absorbed heat that it would get hotter, but it's actually absorbing the energy from the surroundings and creating new bonds inside that. And so consequently, the surroundings get colder. And so when you're holding the beaker of an endothermic reaction, it'll get cold to the touch an exothermic reaction will get warm to the touch. All right, well, we have a sign convention about this. We assign a value of Q that's negative for exothermic reactions and positive for endothermic reactions. And this is pretty much universal. Whenever energy is given off by a system, it's generally given a negative sign because there's a drop in energy from the initial point to the final point. Now, in order to measure these exchanges of energy, this exchange of heat from the system to the surroundings, we've got to uh, define a couple of things here first. Okay, and one of those things that we need to define is the specific heat of a substance. It turns out this is the payment that it takes to raise the temperature of something one degree centigrade, actually per gram. As a matter of fact, that's the definition. The heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of a pure substance, one degree centigrade. Now, every compound, every element has its own unique specific heat. Some things heat up faster than others. Metals heat up very quickly. You can convince yourself of this. Take a metal spoon, turn on the flame on your stove, and just hold it in there for a second. It heats up real quick. On the other hand, a ceramic coffee mug can absorb a lot of heat, yet its temperature doesn't go up very much. So different substances have different payments required to raise their temperature one degree centigrade. For water, for instance, which is a pretty high payment, water takes a significant amount of heat to warm it up. It's 4.184 joules per gram per degree centigrade. That means for each gram, for each degree, 
that's how much it's going to require. All right, so in order to calculate, say, how much heat it would take to warm up a sample of a substance, like question number one on your pre-lab, we would need to know the payment, the specific heat. How much does it cost to heat it up one degree centigrade per gram? We'd also need to know how many grams we want to heat up and how many degrees we want to heat it up. Let's do a quick example of that. Hold on just a sec. All right, suppose we've got enough water here to make ourselves a cup of tea, about 250 milliliters, that'd be about 250 grams of water. Well, the specific heat for that water, let me use S, is 4.184 joules per gram per degree centigrade. Well, it's at room temperature, so let's say it's around 20 degrees centigrade, but I want to heat it up to make a cup of tea, so I'm going to take it up to boiling. 100 degrees centigrade. So my question is, how many joules of energy would it require to input into that water to raise the temperature from 20 degrees to 100? Well, the heat to warm something up is equal to the specific heat, which is given in joules per gram per degree, times the mass, which is given in grams, times the change in temperature, delta T, which will give in degrees centigrade. Note that the units would then come out specifically in joules for the heat to warm something up. Well, let's plug in what we know here. The specific heat for water, 4.184 joules per gram degree. 250 grams. Now my delta T, the change in temperature, is not either of these two, it's the change in temperature, so that would be an 80 degree change. So let's put in 80 degrees for our delta T. Well, this turns out to be 83,700 joules. At least out to the third sig fig or 83.7 kilojoules. So just to heat up a cup of water from 20 degrees from room temperature up to boiling would require 83.7 kilojoules of energy. So again, you can see it's not too difficult to calculate the energy required to warm something up. So question number one on your pre-lab does exactly that. They give you the specific heat, the mass of a sample, and they tell you how many degrees they want to heat it up. All right, one other thing we need to look at, though, before we move on here is something called heat capacity. Hold on just a second. Okay, very subtle difference between heat capacity and specific heat. It turns out specific heat is, is defined per gram of a substance. On the other hand, heat capacity is the heat required to raise the temperature of a particular object, the entire object, one degree centigrade. For instance, if I went over to the construction area over by the gym out of, on campus, they have a pallet of bricks sitting there. If I picked out a brick and took that brick in the lab and figured out, well, how many joules does it take to heat up this particular brick one degree centigrade for the whole brick? Well, it would be a sizable number of joules, and I could paint that right on the side of the brick that that's the heat capacity for this brick takes this many joules to heat it up one degree. If I went back and got another brick, there's no guarantee that it has the same mass or the same density as the first brick. And when I measure its heat capacity, it would probably be significantly different. So each object would have its own unique heat capacity. Now the reason we bring this up is when we do our reaction today, we want to include the heat absorbed by the styrofoam cup calorimeter that we're going to use. And a styrofoam cup takes about 10 joules to heat it up one degree centigrade. 
So we're going to assume that all of our styrofoam cups, unlike the bricks, are pretty close to the same mass. And so the heat capacity, let's say for a styrofoam cup being 10 joules per degree centigrade, notice that it doesn't have the mass of the cup. It just says for the entire cup, if we want to heat it up one degree, it's going to require 10 joules to do that. All right, well, let's do just a quick calculation with this. In this case, in order to calculate the heat required to heat up the styrofoam cup that we're using in our experiment, all we need is the heat capacity of the cup. For instance, suppose the delta T turned out to be 6 degrees centigrade. Well, that means that the cup required 10 joules for each of those degrees centigrade. And again, we'll use this as our standard today for our styrofoam cup, times the 6 degrees. So easy enough, 60 joules. Actually, I'm only good to two sig figs, so let me just put 60 joules. Okay, so heat capacity doesn't have a mass term in it because, again, that's kind of taken into account with the heat capacity of the entire cup. Okay, so let's put this all together and see how we can calculate then the heat given off by a reaction run in a styrofoam cup. Okay, had we been in the lab today, we would have very likely used our temperature probes and the computer as a high-tech thermometer. But today we're going to do it the old-fashioned way here in the barn with an old-fashioned thermometer. But this is the way the reaction would have run. We would have had styrofoam cup. Actually, we usually have you nest a couple of them together. Put a little magnetic stir bar in there just to keep things stirring. We put a temperature probe in here that we can hook up directly to the computer, just a little stainless steel temperature probe. And we're gonna have you put 100 milliliters of hydrochloric acid in here, one molar, not too strong, and then essentially have you dump in some magnesium. Well, we'd have the computer essentially then just monitor the temperature. And so we'd see an initial temperature before we added the magnesium, the temperature would rise and then would steady, would plateau. And we would just measure our delta T directly from the graph like this. And so in our calculation of, well, how much heat did the reaction give off? We could use that delta T from our graph. Well, today what we're gonna do is just write down the beginning temperature and the ending temperature and just use that as our delta T. Well, let me erase this and we'll get on to the next step. All right, so in today's experiment, the heat that we're going to measure given off by the reaction in our styrofoam cup calorimeters is equal to the negative of the heat absorbed by the surroundings, which means the solution in the cup and the cup itself. Now, again, it, it seems pretty obvious that if the heat's leaving the system, it's going to end up in the surroundings. And the sign convention would dictate that we put a negative sign on one of them because they'd have to be opposite in sign. If the heat's leaving one place, it's exothermic. It would become endothermic when it landed at the other place. So consequently, they'd have to be opposite in sign. Now, the heat of the reaction, then, if we separate this out, would be the heat absorbed by the solution that's in our styrofoam cup today. We're going to put 100 milliliters of hydrochloric acid in there that's going to get heated up. But there's also the heat absorbed by the cup itself. Now the solution, if you read through the lab text, is pretty much mostly water. So we're going to use the specific heat for water to calculate how much heat was absorbed by the solution. We put in 100 milliliters of hydrochloric acid, which they tell you has a density of around one gram per milliliter. That means the mass of our solution is about 100 grams. We'll get our delta T from the graph. And we'll add an additional 10 joules per degree for the cup, also times its delta T. So again, I'm sorry, times the same delta T as we use for the solution. We're going to assume that the cup and the solution both reach exactly the same temperature. 
Now this is what we're going to do for our experiment. We're going to run a couple reactions and measure the heat given off by a small sample of magnesium and hydrochloric acid and a small sample of magnesium oxide and hydrochloric acid as mentioned before. But to show you how this calculation works, let's do problem number two on your pre-lab. Hold on just a sec. All right. Here's problem number two on your pre-lab. I'll let you guys kind of read along. It says that we're going to react one gram of sodium hydroxide with some hydrochloric acid. Now, from our acid-base discussions, we know that this is a pretty exothermic reaction, so the temperature is going to go up. It says they're going to do it with 100 milliliters of HCl, and they tell you the density of the solution is about one gram per milliliter. So there is also one gram of sodium hydroxide we're adding in there. So approximately 101 grams for the mass of our solution. They said to use the specific heat for water, which was 4.184 joules per gram degree. And the delta T they tell us in the problem is 10.5 degrees centigrade. That that's how much the temperature went up. In addition, they tell us that the heat capacity of the cup is 10 joules per degree centigrade. And again, we'll use the 10.5 degrees here for our delta T for the cup also. All right, so we've got our mass, the 101 grams. We've got our specific heat, the 4.184 joules per gram degree. I think we've got everything that we need to calculate how much heat was actually given off by this reaction of one gram of sodium hydroxide. Well, let's crunch the numbers. It, and so the Q for the reaction comes out to be 4,542 joules. Now we're not quite done yet. Actually, let me put the negative sign in there. I forgot. It was down here. I just didn't carry it. Now remember that this was only for a one gram sample of sodium hydroxide, but they asked for the answer in kilojoules per mole of sodium hydroxide. So we still have a little bit of legwork to do. Let me erase a little bit of this and we'll finish it off. All right, well this one gram of sodium hydroxide, which by the way, one mole of sodium hydroxide, if you total up the atomic uh, masses, is 40 grams. This represents only 0.025 moles of sodium hydroxide used. But they want to know how much would the heat have been had we used an entire mole? Well, what we need to do if they want it in kilojoules per mole is to first change this to kilojoules and simply divide it by the number of moles that we used. This would tell us what we call the enthalpy of the reaction, the delta H of the reaction. So in, in essence, then we'll take the negative 4542 joules and divide it by a thousand. So that would be 4.54 kilojoules. Moving the decimal place back three, and I trimmed this back to three significant figures. Divided by the 0 0.025 moles that we used, comes out to be negative 182 kilojoules per mole of sodium hydroxide. So most calorimetry problems pretty much follow this vein. They give you the delta T of the reaction and they want to know how much heat was absorbed by the surroundings. And generally they've run the reaction for a scaled down version of the reaction. They won't use an entire mole of ingredient they'll use one gram or a quarter of a gram and then sort of back calculate to figure out, well, how much would it be had we used an entire mole? All right, so here's how we're going to apply what we just looked at in question number two on the pre-lab to our lab experiment today. The first reaction we're gonna run is the magnesium and the hydrochloric acid to give us magnesium chloride and hydrogen gas. Again, today we're letting the hydrogen gas escape we're gonna put 100 milliliters of one molar HCl in the styrofoam cup, and we're gonna monitor the temperature for a few seconds. Then we're gonna add approximately a quarter of a gram, 0.25 grams of magnesium. 
Now I haven't weighed out the sample yet, but once we do, we're going to have to calculate exactly how many moles we use because we're going to want this in kilojoules per mole of magnesium. So once we get an accurate mass, we'll get an accurate number of moles and put it on the report sheet. Now, once we react that, then essentially we're going to find the Q of the reaction the same way we did question number two on the pre-lab. You're going to need the specific heat of the solution times the mass of the solution times the delta T that we'll get from the reaction. Plus, we're going to add the heat capacity of the cup also times delta T. Once we have that heat of reaction, if you recall, the specific heat and the heat capacity are both given in joules, but we need our answer in kilojoules. So we're going to divide this by 1,000 to make it into kilojoules. And then we're going to divide it by the number of moles of magnesium used. This will give us our answer in kilojoules per mole of magnesium. Now for this first reaction, it seems like we come out in the negative 400 to negative 500 kilojoules per mole when we finally get down here to this final number. So once we run the experiment, we'll see if we come in in that neighborhood. We usually get a delta T for this reaction with a quarter of a gram and 100 mils. The change in temperature usually comes in in the six degree range, but we'll see how ours goes. All right, well, let's go and run the experiment. All right, well, this is our reaction of magnesium with hydrochloric acid. I've prepared 100 milliliters of one molar hydrochloric acid. I'm going to pour it in our Dixie cup calorimeter. There's a magnetic stir bar in there so we can stir it up and you notice the thermometer so we can monitor the temperature. I'm going to go ahead and start it stirring. And we just want to get an initial temperature here. I'll try to read it as accurately as I can, but let's let it stir for just a little bit and kind of reach equilibrium. Now, one thing I'd like to point out is I weighed out a sample that was 0 0.248 grams of magnesium. And the magnesium is the limiting reagent here. There's more than enough hydrochloric acid in there to eat this up. So when we calculate the heat of this reaction, we're going to do it per mole of the magnesium. Now granted, we're only using about a thousandth of a mole, so whatever answer we get here, we're going to have to bump it up by a factor so that we can see what the heat would have been had it been an actual mole of magnesium. If we use that much magnesium, we need a huge styrofoam cup, so much better to do it this way. Well, let me check the temperature. Hold on just a second. I'd say it's at 22... Oh, and it's just a hair above, 22.1. 22.1 degrees centigrade. Now I'm going to dump the magnesium in. And with this hydrochloric acid, it should react pretty rapidly. And we should see a pretty good temperature increase. So I might have to fast forward here, give this a chance to react. But then we'll get a good read on the temperature. Remember the initial temperature, 22.1 degrees centigrade. Okay, the temperature seems to have maxed out. Remember we started at 22.1 degrees centigrade and we ended at 33.5 five degrees centigrade. So 22.1 to 33.5, that gives us a delta T of 11.4. I think earlier I mentioned that I anticipated it would be around six. I think I was mistaken. It's actually 11.4. Well, let's go to the report sheet and record a little bit of this and then back to the blackboard. Okay, well, let's input our data for trial one. The grams of magnesium we used was 0 0.248 grams. Now remember, we're going to have to convert that into moles later because we need to divide by the number of moles of magnesium we used. Our initial temperature on this one was 22.1 degrees Celsius. And our final temperature was 33.5.
So essentially we got an 11.4 degree delta T. Now to calculate the delta H for that magnesium reaction, just a reminder, we're going to take the specific heat of water, which the solution in the cup was mostly water, so 4.184 for the specific heat. The mass of the solution was approximately 100 grams. I suppose you could say 100 plus the quarter of a gram of magnesium, but that's outside the realm of our significant figures. So just 100 is fine for the mass. And our delta T was the 11.4 degrees. We're going to add an additional 10 degrees, or 10 joules, I'm sorry, per degree for the cup, also times delta T. Remember, this is the heat absorbed by the solution. This is the heat absorbed by the cup. Now that number, again being negative because this is an exothermic reaction, needs to be divided by a thousand in order to convert it into kilojoules. But then we also want to divide by the number of moles of magnesium we actually used. This will give us our final answer in kilojoules per mole. Now if things went correctly, this should come out between minus 400 and minus 500 kilojoules per mole for our first reaction. All right, well, let's go back to the bench and run lab or, uh, trial number two. Okay, well, let's take a look at our second reaction. This is the reaction of magnesium oxide, remember, with hydrochloric acid. Now, we're going to start again with another 100 milliliters of one molar HCl in the cup. And monitor the temperature for a few seconds just to get our initial temperature. Then we're going to add in this time, this time we're going to add one gram of magnesium oxide. Now again, we're going to have to calculate how many moles of magnesium oxide that is because we'll need it in our calculations later. So we'll look up the atomic masses here and, and figure out how many moles of magnesium oxide that is. All right, well, the heat of the reaction then is going to be the negative of the heat absorbed by the solution that's in the cup, which is the 100 milliliters, so this would be the specific heat times the mass times delta T. Now this time the mass is going to be about 101 grams. Remember our 100 milliliters of HCl weighs about 100 grams, so we'll use 101 for our mass. The specific heat is still the same, the specific heat of water, 4.184, and we'll get the delta T from our graph, or not from our graph, but from our temperature reading. We're going to add an additional 10 joules per degree for the cup, again times the same delta T, again assuming that the cup and the solution in the cup both reach the same temperature. Now remember that that heat of reaction is given in joules, but we want it in kilojoules, so we're going to have to divide by a thousand to put it into kilojoules. And we're going to have to divide it by the number of moles of magnesium oxide used. So you'll have to calculate how many moles one gram of magnesium oxide is. Now again, our mileage may vary. We'll see what the mass actually comes out when I weigh it out. This will give us our answer in kilojoules per mole of magnesium oxide. Now, don't forget that the negative sign goes all the way through here, so this should come out as an exothermic reaction and have a negative value, same as our first reaction. Okay, well, let's go and run this experiment and find out what our delta T was. All right, well, we're ready for our second trial. We're going to react magnesium oxide, and I weighed out 1.004 grams of magnesium oxide. So we'll jot that down here in a second on our report sheet. I got another 100 mils of one molar HCl ready to go. Got my stir bar in there. Get it stirring at a decent rate. Let's check our initial temperature. This has been sitting out of room temperature, so I'm assuming it's around 22 again, but we'll double check just to make sure. And I'm glad we did. It's a little bit cooler. It's actually at 20, 20.8 degrees. So that's our initial temperature, 20.8.
Well, I'm going to dump in the magnesium oxide, and we'll see. And I want to get my stir bar going pretty good clip because that's a lot of powder to dissolve. So starting at 20.8. Temperature's rising. Now this time we should get a, a temperature rise, you know, in on the order of seven, eight degrees, something like that. And so give it a little bit of time, we'll let it equilibrate and get reach its maximum temperature. So let me fast forward here a little bit. Well, it looks as if the temperature is maxed out and it looks like it's at about 28.3. So we started at 20.8. We went up to 28.3. That's a 7.5 degree uh, increase in temperature. Well, we figured between 7 and 8. That sounds pretty good. All right, well, let's go to the report sheet and put the numbers in and then we'll head back to the blackboard. All right, well, the data for trial number two, 1.004 grams of magnesium oxide used. Again, we're going to have to calculate how many moles of magnesium oxide that is, because we're going to need it later. Our initial temperature was 20.8. Our final temperature was 28.3 for a delta T of 7.5 degrees Celsius. Now again, let me scooch this up just a tad and we can show you the calculation for the magnesium oxide. The Q, just like before, is going to be the negative of the specific heat, which again we'll use 4.184. The mass of the solution, this time we could use 101 grams since we had an entire gram of magnesium oxide. Our delta T was 7.5 degrees from up above. We're going to add an additional 10 joules per degree centigrade. Again, that's the heat capacity of the cup. Also times that 7.5 degree delta T. Now remember, this Q does come out in joules, so we're going to have to divide by 1,000 to make it into kilojoules. And then we're going to have to divide that by the number of moles of magnesium oxide used. Now for both experiments, please somewhere on your report sheet, show me how you calculated the number of moles of magnesium used in part one and the number of moles of magnesium oxide used in part two. But this should give you your answer then in kilojoules per mole of magnesium oxide. Now in the past, this usually comes in between, oh, negative 100 and negative 200. All right, well, let's go back to the blackboard then. Well, we wanted to collect this data today on the heats of the reactions for the magnesium and the magnesium oxide, actually to illustrate another aspect of thermochemistry, and that's something called Hess's Law. Probably easier if I just show you rather than put a definition up here. It turns out if we take carbon, for instance, as a solid and burn it in just a short supply of oxygen in order to make carbon monoxide gas, that the heat given off by the reaction here, the delta H, turns out to be about minus 283.5 kilojoules. Now that's for a mole of carbon burned in just a, a limited amount of oxygen in order to make carbon monoxide gas. However, if we take that carbon monoxide gas, we react it with a little bit more oxygen to make CO2 as a gas, it liberates another 110 kilojoules. So I guess my question is this, what if we combine the two steps? Instead of doing this step by step to make carbon monoxide first and then use it to make carbon dioxide, what if we want a straight shot from the carbon directly to the CO2? Literally just adding the two reactions together and treating the arrow here like a big equal sign. 
we could cancel out anything that was the same on both sides of the equal sign. Well, if I added the two reactions here together, essentially then the carbon monoxide would cancel out and I'd have this reaction. If I combine the two steps, I'd have a carbon and an entire oxygen molecule making CO2. Well, it turns out that delta H is the sum of those two steps. Seems very logical that if you just leap down both steps at once, the distance you traveled is the sum of the two steps. So sure enough, this is minus 393.5 kilojoules. Well, this is an example of Hess's law. He said if you know the heats of certain steps of a reaction, when you add them together, the overall heat should equal the sum of those steps. All right, simple enough. Now, there's a couple rules here, though, that when we play this Hess's Law game, sometimes we may give you pieces of the puzzle where you may have to flip a reaction over. For instance, what would the heat of the reaction be if we took the CO2 gas and tried to decompose it into carbon and, and oxygen? Well, instead of being minus 393.5 kilojoules, since we're running it uphill instead of downhill, the delta H would be positive 393.5. Well, change in direction of a reaction just simply changes the sign of the delta H. There's one other little rule that we use when we play this Hess's Law game. What if we doubled everything here and took two CO2s to make two carbons to make and two oxygens? Well, in essence, then it would double also the delta H value. Can you see that times two out there at the very edge of the screen? All right, so those are the rules of Hess's law. We can add reactions together and anything that's the same on both sides of the arrow, we can cancel it out. We can flip a reaction over as long as we're willing to change the sign of the delta H. And we can take any multiple of a reaction as long as we're willing to take the same multiple of that delta H. Now with those tools, let's look at problem number three that was on your pre-lab. Okay, so here's the layout for question number three. It said, could you find the delta H for this reaction, the reaction of C2H2 plus a couple hydrogens to make C2H4? They want to know that delta H. Could you build that reaction from these three pieces? Again, given our rules that we're allowed to flip reactions over and change the sign of the delta H or take any multiple of any reaction. Well, fortunately, they've given us just the exact pieces we need in order to build this reaction. And here's my philosophy. If I'm trying to build this, I'll just start with the very first molecule on the left, and I'll find which reaction has that piece in it. Well, it's pretty obvious here. Let's number these equations. Let's make this one, two, and three. Well, the C2H2 appears only in equation number one. So I'm going to rewrite equation number one. And by the way, it comes in the proper amount. There's just one mole of it. And it's on the proper side of the arrow, on the left side of the arrow. So I'm going to take equation one as is. And I'm going to rewrite it down here. C2H2 plus five halves of an O2 to make two CO2s and a water. And you'll note that the delta H they gave us for that reaction was minus 1,300 kilojoules. All right, well, I've got one of the pieces then that I need in my final construction of this reaction. The next thing I need are hydrogens, two of them, on the left side of the arrow. Well, they only appear in equation number two, and they are on the proper side of the arrow, but they're in half the amount that I want. So I'm going to double equation number two and double the hydrogen, double the oxygen to one, and make two waters. Well, now the delta H of this reaction is not minus 286, but it's two times minus 286. 
again because I doubled the reaction. Well, now I've got the other piece that I need. Well, I now need the C2H4 and I need it on the right side of the arrow and I need one mole of it. Well, where did it happen? It didn't happen anywhere, C2H4. Oh, I'm sorry, it's C2H6, that's why. <laughs> there you go, that works. To make C2H6, well, it does appear in equation number three, but it's on the wrong side of the arrow. We need to flip equation number three. Well, in flipping it, I'll put the two CO2s on this side. I'll put the three waters on this side. I'll put the C2H6 and our seven halves of an, of an O2. Now, in this case, instead of being minus 1560, this is going to be positive 1560 kilojoules. So we've got all the pieces that we wanted. We got the C2H2, we've got the 2H2s going to C2H6. Sorry about my typo up there above. Now, notice that we've got to make sure that there are no loose ends, that everything else canceled out correctly. And it appears that the CO2s canceled out right there. There's three waters on this side. Well, here's one and here's two, so the water's all canceled. The oxygens, here's five halves of an oxygen. Here's two halves of an oxygen. So I have seven halves on this side, seven halves on that side. Sure enough, everything canceled out except for, oh, except for those things that we wanted to keep. So consequently, now that I've manipulated these equations in such a way that they'll add up to equal the one I wanted, I can now add up the manipulated delta H's in order to get the final answer here for delta H. I'll let you do the arithmetic. Okay, so here's how we're going to apply Hess's law to the lab that we did today. We measured the heats of reaction for these two reactions here on the top, the magnesium and the hydrochloric acid and the magnesium oxide and the hydrochloric. Ultimately, what we want you to do is use that information to figure out, using Hess's law, the delta H of this reaction, the combustion of magnesium. We did this a couple times in lab where we had you burn a strip of magnesium. You remember, it's really bright. Well, that would be a difficult reaction to run in a styrofoam cup. might actually be a little dangerous uh, to try to measure the heat of that reaction with that styrofoam. But there is a roundabout way that we can calculate the heat of this reaction by using the reactions that we ran in aqueous solution today. Now, you did these top two, and the delta H for experiment one, the magnesium, should have come out in the O minus 400 to minus 500 range. Usually the delta H for the magnesium oxide comes out, oh, somewhere in the minus 100 kilojoule range. And in addition, we've given you the heat of this reaction, the combustion of hydrogen. Delta H for one mole of hydrogen turns out to be minus 285.8. Well, you can understand then that there is a way that you could manipulate these three equations in such a way that they'll add up to equal this one at the top just like the problem we just did for the pre-lab. You can see we need two magnesiums on the left here. Well, it only appears in equation number one, but we'll have to double it and likewise double our delta H. We need a couple magnesium oxides on that side. Well, we'll have to double equation two and flip it over, which remember changes the sign and doubles the value. And in order to get the oxygens in there, we'll have to use equation number three. Well, I think you find that once you manipulate these three equations in such a way that they equal this equation, then we can add together the manipulated delta H's to get the delta H for that combustion of magnesium. Hot diggity dog. All right, the back of the report sheet for Hess's Law. Number one, just simply wants you to write the three thermochemical equations that you need to calculate the delta H for our combustion of magnesium uh, in the presence of oxygen. Remember, this is the equation that we're trying to build from these three pieces. Now, the top two pieces, we did 
on the previous page. Remember, this came in somewhere between minus 400 and minus 500. This one came in between minus 100 and minus 200. In addition, we gave you this equation on the page one of the lab text, uh, the combustion of hydrogen in the presence of oxygen. It has a delta H of minus 285.8 kilojoules. In number one, they simply wanted you to write these three equations that we were going to use. Number two, however, is what I'm going to leave up to you. They want us to rearrange these equations, flip them, take whatever multiples we have to of them in order to build this equation. They want you to show how everything canceled out and left you with just the combustion of magnesium. In addition, we want the manipulated delta H's. If you flipped an equation, you have to change the sign. If you take a multiple of an equation, you take the same multiple of its delta H. So in this space provided, it says, neatly rewrite the three equations, multiply them, reverse them, etc., such that when added, the result is the thermochemical equation for the combustion of magnesium. And then sum up your manipulated delta H's. Now the accepted value for this which we're going to use down here in question number three. For two moles of magnesium should have come out negative 1202.4 theoretically. Our answer should have come out somewhere near that. So we want to know what's the percent error between your value and the accepted value of minus 1202.4. Well remember to do a percent error you just take your value minus the accepted value divided by the accepted times 100. So please calculate your percent error. All right, well, I think we've pretty much wrapped up the report sheet. So make sure that you've got everything complete. Don't forget your units. Okay, well, that's that. We've now calculated the heaps of reaction for the magnesium, the magnesium oxide. We've used Hess's law to figure out the delta H for the combustion of magnesium in the presence of oxygen. Did it sort of in a theoretical way. Uh, so again, make sure that your report sheet is completely filled out along with your pre-lab and either scan it or take a picture of it, probably the easiest way, and email it to either me or Dr. Halverson, depending on who your lecture instructor is. Now we'll try to keep these coming. We've got a couple more lined up for you. So keep an eye on your email and we'll make sure we keep you posted. Hopefully see you next week from Labs in the Barn.